Good morning, everybody, uh, and, and welcome to the International Institute for Strategic Studies webinar, uh, Defense and Security Impacts of COVID-19 U.S. Defense Strategy. I'm David Gordon, uh, Senior Advisor for Geoeconomics and Strategy at I. Double S, uh, and it's my pleasure this morning to host this webinar. Uh, this is the first of three on the broad topic of the impact of COVID uh, on defense and security around the world. Today's session uh, is focusing on the US. Uh, our second session uh, will be focused on Europe. Uh, that will be held on October 7th at 11 a.m. U.S. time. Uh, and then our third session uh, is yet to be pinned down in terms of the exact date. It will be later in October and will focus on Asia and in particular on the China dimension and how how China uh, and responses to China are reshaping uh, the, the um, defense and security environment in Asia. Uh, so today, uh, I'm very pleased to be able to host three experts uh, and three great people. Mackenzie Eaglin, who's a resident fellow uh, at AEI, uh, Michael O'Hanlon, uh, who uh, is at the Brookings Institute, and Franz Stefan Gotti uh, from Double uh, who is now based here in New York. Uh, I will ask each of them to speak 10 or 12 minutes, uh, and then following that we will open up to questions and comments uh, and dialogue from the floor. Right now we have somewhat over 50 participants. Uh, so if you would like to ask a question, uh, please raise your hand uh, and I will try to take those, uh, th those raise hands uh, in, in person, uh, you will see uh, uh, the, the raise hand function uh, uh, at the bottom of your screen and we can all see now the, uh, the, um, the mechanism for doing that. Uh, so without further ado, uh, let me first talk uh, about the themes that we're, we're going to address. I think the, there are four main issues here that, that we're going to be talking about today. Uh, the first is the impact of COVID-19 on the risk environment and on the perception of risk. Uh, the, the second is on the budgets, the, uh, and the impact of fiscal pressures potentially uh, on defense and security spending. Uh, the, the third is on strategy. Uh, and then the, the fourth is, is really on the question, the broader question of power uh, and, and influence the sort of grand strategic question coming out of this. Um, so I would like to turn first to Mackenzie Eaglin, uh, and then we will go second to Mike O'Hanlon, third to Ron Stefan Gatti. Mackenzie? Well, good morning. Thanks for having me, especially to be with uh, amongst such good friends. Uh, you know, I think what we saw here in the U.S. was that uh, the Defense Department was caught a little flat-footed in the early days of COVID, but uh, really 
to their credit, improved dramatically, caught up, and impressively um, did better the, you know, the longer this has gone on, figuring out that they have to basically fight, work, and train through a pandemic, even though at first they were much like the rest of the world and, and shutting down uh, uh, much too deeply. So what was interesting was part of the reason for this, this flat-footedness in the early days, was that the Pentagon's you know, playbook for responding to a pandemic, their war plan was based on a 2013 uh, campaign for pandemic influenza and infectious disease. And that was based upon a 2009 swine flu uh, playbook. So you know, obviously this had, had fresh thinking inside the building for a while. The joint staff recently conducted its own internal review of how they've been doing since March and found these sort of similar findings um, that they should have launched um, uh, an, like an early on assessment to, to grade how they're doing to, to catch up in real time to the challenges that they were facing across the force. Uh, they underestimated the, the spread of the virus and the global nature of this modern pandemic. Uh, the military, which was partly in charge of distributing, but also identifying um, and in some cases uh, getting from scratch, uh, helping distribute medical supplies. They had difficulty doing this logistically as well as supply chains like everybody else. So you see a lot of overlap between what's happening in uh, the real world with the rest of us, the commercial society and companies as well. But then there were issues with chain of command, uh, you know, about who's supposed to do what, uh, the combatant commanders, the services, the joint staff, particularly when it came to domestic response, right? So, you know, the military did everything from building pop-up temporary hospitals to mortuary affairs. And uh, in some cases there was confusion about who should do what, when, uh, particularly as the Defense Department, you know, they are in support of state and local authorities in, in this, these cases. It wasn't all bad news, of course. So, you know, there was a, the gold standard really was US forces Korea, which saw one of the earlier uh, small outbreaks of the virus on the peninsula before it really even hit the shores of the US in particular. But um, General Abrams really, just, I don't know where he got his ideas, but he basically started these safety bubbles uh, where you know, he took these early actions with a 24 seven operations center to monitor the situation, tracking employees who particularly had traveled, traveled through China, um, raising the health conditions on post, developing communication plans, requiring self quarantines and additional precautions. So this really was the gold standard as opposed to what we saw, which was the worst case scenario, which was the USS Theodore Roosevelt, uh, the aircraft carrier that eventually had to uh, dock at Guam for nearly 70 days with a sick crew and a, a virus spreading and an international news incident and one sailor's death as a result. And that was a very different outcome, partly because um, one is a ship <laughs> and one is a, on land. And so they, what the Defense Department found was in some cases, universal guidelines aren't enough. In some cases, you need service specific instructions. So, you know, the small galleys of ships and, you know, the stacking on top of each other for birthing and sleeping. These are just issues that they can, cannot be overcome. So how do you work through them and with them? Uh, so the Defense Department has had to learn not to make the same mistake twice into the Navy's credit. When the USS Kidd, a smaller but still significantly sized destroyer, uh, had an outbreak, they took the lessons learned from the TR and, and were able to learn from that. Even our basic training, uh, boot camp, uh, recruiting, you know, it's it's interesting. There's some, there is some good news of 2020. I know that's hard to believe, but uh, you know, by instituting certain temperature checks and health screenings and, and social distancing and sort of quarantines, uh, what the Defense Department found is they're never going to go back to the way it was in some cases, meaning by uh, catching all upper respiratory infections, now sick calls down to like basically zero everywhere across the board. So, you know, they're getting the flus and the other colds and coughs that can bring down units, which is some great lessons learned, teleworking, etc. So that's just to give you a sense of kind of how they've been doing. I would say on messaging, uh, this again here, you see the leadership a little slow to catch up. Um, the Pentagon leaders for a while, there was a lot of domestic unrest here in the US as well. And that combined with the pandemic uh, was, was increasing calls of, across the board, including from some con conservatives to fund domestic safety and law enforcement at the expense of national security, which is of course the military's job is to look outward and, and protect 
um, our citizens from threats that aren't necessarily right here in the US. And I don't think leaders were prepared to answer the, those calls. Uh, it, now they're starting to sound a little bit better. Uh, they understand that the two missions are complementary. They are not zero sum. They do not come at the expense of the other. Uh, you need both and the American people need both. But you know we have an understandable debt bomb that has arisen from uh, coronavirus and the three stimulus bills, a fourth likely to come from Congress after the election. It's basically authorized about four trillion in spending so far, and this is really record breaking, in, not only just in terms of overall publicly held debt, but in terms of annual deficits as well. Uh, we're even breaking in some cases, depending on how you look at it, World War II records. So this is one of the reasons there's anxiety uh, domestically and, and these calls for increased um, spending on public health and safety. Uh, I think though what you have, what we can also see, and the Pentagon knows this, is there's if there's one thing the pandemic has also done besides force us to spend a lot of money, and I'll be here virtually today, the other is that it has broadened the, uh, the Americans' views towards China in a negative way, and it has hardened those views. So whereas it used to be, you know, sort of a small group, and then it was, you know, defense thinkers and security-minded people, now it's, it's the majority of Americans who, who uh, see that the, that the pacing threat really is long-term competition with China. And this was just the, the sort of straw that broke the proverbial camel's back. So I'll stop talking, David, and, and see if you want me to pull any of those threads. David, you're still Sorry muted. about that. Sorry about that. Thank you very, very much. Really interesting. There's a lot there that we'll be able to follow up on. Michael, over to you. David, thank you. And Mackenzie, fantastic start. Great framing. Let me try to pick up where you left off. Uh, I'm very happy that you spent so much time on the readiness of the force, which I think is a crucially important issue. And frankly, to some extent, we sort of almost can overlook it or take it for granted at this juncture because we haven't heard the horror stories uh, like the kid in the Roosevelt for a while. And we've sort of internalized the successes of General Abrams and others and Secretary Esper but I think it's really worth taking note that this is a crucial and important reality that we should be grateful for to the extent it holds up. But let me pick up on threats where uh, you mentioned the hardening of US views on China. And I think more generally, I agree with that, but I would also say that the overall Pentagon threat landscape, which I still like to frame in general Dunford's four plus one uh, you know, uh, concept, I think that is still useful. And also, the, I don't see any evidence that any of those threats have become less important to the United States or its allies since the outbreak of COVID. And uh, each one has mutated or transformed a bit. You've already talked about China, where uh, the other point one might make is that the economy in China, of course, is already recovering. So China is not going to necessarily have to make tough decisions about military spending or previously planned military buildups. If I look over at Russia, because the four plus one framework, of course, is Russia, China, North Korea, Iran, and then transnational extremism in the broader Middle East in particular. If I go to China, uh, from China to Russia, Russia, of course, has taken a hit with its economy, and especially when oil prices just went down to zero or even, I think, negative territory for a while, which I can ask David Gordon to explain to me later just how that's possible. But anyway, uh, things are on the gradual uptick back towards $40 plus or minus per barrel. But the overall point here is that Vladimir Putin doesn't need a ton of money to do the kinds of things that he's pretty good at. He only used a few thousand troops in Syria. He only used a few thousand people in Ukraine and he can stoke a lot of trouble on a shoestring budget. Uh, it may set back his grandiose ambitions for a large scale nuclear modernization, but he can still invent some crazy new warhead types and make a lot out of those and threaten us. And so I don't see the Russian threat being mitigated by COVID-19. Of course, Putin may even have to double down in some sense on his antagonisms with the outside world to the extent that he can no longer deliver economic stability and progress in Russia, which was his original reason for popularity back in the 2000s after the nightmare of the Yeltsin years. Uh, and so to the extent that Putin needs something to go to the people with, maybe he doesn't, maybe he'll just, you know, kill all of his opponents. We've seen more of that lately, uh, or his attempts to do so. 
but to the extent he wants to have a popularity in Russia and to be able to claim to his people that he's delivered in some sense, uh, I think that stoking ongoing competition with the West is probably still you know, uh, an appealing option. I'm not suggesting he's likely to attack a NATO country with a traditional overland invasion, but I think almost anything short of that is imaginable. Moving over to North Korea, maybe the least afflicted in terms of internal COVID cases, uh, but only because they've doubled down on their hermit kingdom approach to the world after three years of economic recession brought about by the sanctions that the UN placed uh, after the 2017 missile and nuclear tests. We hear a lot about how those sanctions are not being widely respected, how they're eroding. That's true, but they're also having a big impact because they are so sweeping. So even imperfect implementation of those sanctions has put a crimp in North Korea's style. Uh, and perhaps this is part of why Kim Jong-un keeps alternating between charm offensives and aggression uh, and can't seem to quite figure out an overall strategy, just as President Trump can't quite figure out a strategy as to whether he wants to reach out and do a deal with North Korea, maybe a partial deal on the nukes, or whether he wants to still you know, take a more John Bolton-esque approach and try to drive them into the ground and get complete denuclearization. Regardless, we are still in a very tense situation with North Korea. We should all be reminded by Bob Woodward's book of, of how close we came to war three years ago, and that could happen again, which is a pretty scary thought. Now go to Iran. Iran, of course, has taken a very serious hit from COVID-19, uh, but its people are used to, again, uh, making do without a lot of uh, economic prosperity. They have some degree of influence over their country's politics, but not a lot. And so I don't see any reason to think that the hardliners in Iran, especially because they are still angry by the killing uh, of Qasem Soleimani by a uh, U.S. military strike at the very beginning of 2020, uh, I don't see any evidence that the Iranian hardliners are going to look for an easy way to sort of cry uncle and have relief from sanctions uh, with the Trump administration. To me, it's an opportunity for a Biden administration, as long as they think a little more creatively than just returning to the joint comprehensive plan of action, which I think at this point is not an adequate overall Iran policy. So we'll have to see. But in any event, that one also is in flux and also is tense. And then finally, transnational violent extremism. Perhaps we have a sort of a lid on it at the moment, but if it's a lid, uh, it's a lid where there's a lot of boiling water trying to still push up and out. Uh, in various countries around the world. And just because there's no caliphate at the moment uh, doesn't mean that there aren't plenty of extremist Salafist fighters who would happily create one somewhere else if we gave them the chance, Afghanistan, Syria, Yemen, Libya, you name it. So I see the threat landscape as largely unaffected by COVID. Um, in, in some way, I shouldn't say unaffected, in some ways it's been modified, but it hasn't been mitigated appreciably which then leads me to my other main point, which is that I think the US defense budget and defense posture and strategy more broadly are gonna to have to stay pretty robust going forward. And frankly, I see no evidence that American politics will disagree with me. Both Joe Biden and Donald Trump are basically acknowledging that we still have a dangerous world, that cutting the defense budget to pay for better pandemic response is not the right zero sum way to think about this moment in history. Uh, as Mackenzie knows very well, one of the uh, she's one of the best students on the American defense budget in the entire country, as well as defense strategy more generally. We, we all saw in the Trump's budget, Trump administration's budget last January and February, they were not going to grow the defense budget in the future, even in the absence of a COVID epidemic. Those plans, of course, were created before we understood COVID. And, uh, and yet, even so, we essentially anticipated a flat budget, actually a slight decline in real terms. Uh, if you adjust for inflation over the following five years. And this was at a time when not only General Dunford and not only Secretary Esper, but even Democratic luminaries like Michelle Flournoy, who had been part of panels that McKenzie helped with, uh, like the 2018 panel on national defense, all acknowledged that if you really want to implement this national defense strategy, which has a fair amount of bipartisan support, you need 3% to 5% real growth per year over an extended time horizon. I don't necessarily endorse that particular uh, growth path, but I would acknowledge that a lot of people feel it is required in order to sustain the national defense strategy as envisioned and as mapped out, which means that something's going to have to give in defense, uh, you know, 
even without any kind of big cuts to the defense budget from a COVID-related uh, effort at deficit reduction. So I think the Department of Defense already has huge challenges about making tough choices, finding economies that can allow it to still do modernization, become more resilient, uh, profit from innovation in new kinds of technologies. All of that is essential for great power competition. I worry a lot about cyber vulnerability. I know Franz Stefan's likely to talk about that next. And we're going to have to find some space and some resources for actual increases in certain kinds of efforts to either mitigate vulnerabilities and or to improve lethality and innovation. And we're going to have to do that with a flat defense budget. The last, very last point, which is sort of a, a footnote and to tie it all together in a bow, if there is good news in this overall picture, it's again that I don't think anybody's naive enough to believe that we can cut 100 or $200 billion out of the defense budget as some way uh, to finance uh, how we tackle new threats. And nor do I think that's even necessary. I think it's better to think in the kind of terms that my colleague Bill Gale at Brookings wrote about in his aptly named book, Fiscal Therapy. Uh, we all know that all the deficit hawks used to talk about cutting the defense budget, you know, and, and cutting every other budget to get to zero deficit. And the Ross Perot's and Paul Songus's and Pete Domenici's uh, of our times when a lot of us first came to Washington, uh, they've all moved on to a happier place with hopefully a smaller deficit in the sky. But we don't have any of those people left. And no one's really proposing that we eliminate the deficit or the debt quickly. And so more realistic is to think about bending the curve over time. So if the defense budget holds flat in real terms and declines as a percent of GDP, I think that's already about all you can ask it to do to contribute to long-term deficit reduction. And I think that's a realistic goal that is still consistent with our core national security needs. So if we think in terms of percentages of GDP, and really just flattening the curve so that over not just years, but decades, we get closer to a healthy fiscal position, then I think we can sort of um, get through this turbulent period of austerity. I'll leave it there. Thank you, David. Great. Thank you very, very much, Mike. Uh, Franz, over to you. Yes. Uh, thank you very much, David. It's uh, uh, great to be here. And thank you so much, uh, Mackenzie and uh, Michael, for your excellent insights. Um, I will try to add a few quick points here to complement what the two of you were already saying, and um, I look uh, forward to a good discussion afterwards. Um, <clears throat> I think when it comes to um, the defense budget acquisitions and strategy, um, COVID-19 is really just accentuating pre-existing trends. And I just want to briefly touch upon four different categories here in my uh, short remarks. Um, um, and they are the budget allies, competitors enforce modernization. And I um, just want to quickly go through this here. And so my first point is directly related to um, the defense budget. And it sort of touches upon what Mackenzie was talking about earlier. And it's really a bit of a broader comment here. Um, as we all know, um, COVID-19 has been contributing to an increase in government borrowing in the United States and also um, across the world. Um, by the beginning of this month, I believe the government debt here in the United States stood at around uh, 20 trillion. And um, by the end of this year, it's likely going to be 100% of the gross domestic product. And in comparison to last year, I think it stood at the end in December 2019, it stood at around 80% and uh, 70 trillions. And of course, these numbers have fluctuated throughout the year, but this is really an enormous, enormous uptick. Now, um, interest rate rates have been really low, and that's why you don't hear much about the debt in the news when it comes to uh, the defense budget. And uh, this morning, I checked the 10-year yield on Treasury bonds, and it stands at 0.67%. Um, uh, but here's the deal. Interest payments on the debt are rising and projected to be consuming an increasingly larger share of the government's budget. So this is definitely going to impact the defense budget and discretionary spending in one way or the other down the road. And um, I don't think it is, not, it, it, should, it is not taken as seriously as it should be, and COVID-19 has really, really accentuated this trend. Um, my second point relates um, to allies and partners. And here, I think the fact is that COVID-19 has already negatively impacted US global standing among allies and partners, and really reinforced uh, perceptions among a growing segment of policymakers in those countries that US defense strategy 
will be um, increasingly, increasingly handicapped by three factors, uh, institutional dysfunctionality, political society, uh, societal polarization, and then really an expanding gap between the outlook of policymakers, defense planners, and the larger US electorate about um, the specific role of the United States in the world. And I think this is important to consider given that uh, the current US defense strategy really puts a premium on allies and partners and uh, cooperation with allies and partners in maintaining conventional deterrence vis-a-vis -vis near peer and peer competitors. And I think this will definitely have an impact on US defense uh, security and uh, policy in the long term, of course, as well. And of course, the upcoming election here also will play a huge role in this regard, um, as, as was partially uh, mentioned already. Um, my third point is really about, is, is about competitors and uh, potential US adversaries. And here I think it is clear that COVID-19 has not really impacted the core assumptions of the latest national defense strategy about the US being engaged in a long-term strategic competition with revisionist powers. Um, I think, however, the devil again here is in the detail, because when it comes to the details, uh, I think in the United States, we need to take a harder look to what degree COVID-19 has, has altered specific defense priorities of competitors, which in turn uh, needs to inform U.S. assumptions and defense priorities and, of course, as, uh, strategy as well. And um, just if you look at China and Russia, for example, um, as uh, Michael already mentioned, uh, Russia took a massive financial hit this year. And here, for example, it would be interesting to see to what degree we'll see a slight shift from uh, conventional to more nuclear deterrence. And um, very specifically, when it comes to the national defense strategy, for example, how does this impact escalation management as it is outlined in the national defense strategy? How does it really in impact acquisition plans when it comes, for example, to long range uh, strategic strike capabilities? The same goes for China when we look at it. Um, it is currently recovering economically quite well. But um, what we're seeing, what we've seen for, for the last couple of weeks, for example, vis-a-vis -vis Taiwan could be interpreted in, in a various different ways. Is it just uh, meant to be, uh, uh, meant to look strong, where in reality, uh, the Chinese leadership really perceives uh, the current state of the Chinese economy to be much weaker than it really projects to the outside world? Um, is there going to be a genuine reduction of risk of a military uh, confrontation in the long term? And um, will this, for example, increase or decrease Chinese gray zone activities and really impact what the Joint Chiefs call the competition continuum uh, with the United States overall? And here again, if you look at the nuclear dimension, also there are very specific issues I think that we should probably look at a bit closer. For example, will this COVID-19 in any way accelerate the entanglement of uh, conventional and nuclear command and control capabilities in China um, in order really to deter the United States from a kinetic or non-kinetic, but that I mean cyber and other stuff, um, 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 operations in the, event, in the event of a conflict um, as a result of COVID-19 budgetary restraints. and. Um, my last and final point is about force modernization. And I think here there are really specific risks and opportunities um, um, with regard to, on the one hand, force, a modern future force structure, and then doctrinal uh, development as a result of COVID-19. I think on the plus side, the pandemic will likely add some pressure to accelerate the development of new war fighting concepts in combination with emerging tech. And there has been already a substantial shift right to emerging tech uh, within the Department of Defense, um, really to pre uh, counter the perceived erosion of US conventional deterrence. And by new concepts, I really mean uh, the US Army's concept of multi-domain operations, distributed operation, and then the new joint all domain war fighting concept that is likely going to be rolled out by the end of the, this year by the Joint Chiefs. And um, I think there's actually a great opportunity here for uh, within the Department of Defense really to reach an outside constituency when it comes to these new war fighting concepts, um, especially when you think about the basic idea of distributed operations, right? It could very uh, well be sold to lawmakers and policymakers as the safest way really to uh, guarantee operational readiness and conventional deterrence um, during a pandemic such as COVID-19. And um, I think part of uh, the efforts also that, that are included in this uh, overall idea of new uh, um, operational concepts, the technical underpinning, for example, that the Air Force is working on, the advanced battle management system, has also been used partially to help fight the pandemic, at least the artificial intelligence component of that particular um, system.
However, there's also a downside. And this is really that the potential pressure now to develop, implement, and deploy these um, largely still immature concepts and also emerging technological capabilities could really increase the risk of failure um, of these concepts and also emerging technological capabilities. And I think unlike in the past, um, some of you will probably still remember the whole saga around the future combat system and so forth, um, which was ultimately never deployed. Um, I think um, lawmakers and the public and then of course uh, competitors, competitors may be less forgiving this time um, when it comes to failure in any of these new pro pro uh, programs. And it actually could set back modernization efforts uh, by many years. So I think one has to be very careful how quickly one um, jumps the gun here when it comes to these new concepts as a result of COVID-19. So um, just to sum up, I think the bottom line for me is that COVID-19 is really acting as an accelerator of pre-existing trends when it comes to the defense budget and defense strategy. And I don't think that the virus has really created any particular new strategic problems. Uh, I think it just much more sheds light on the fact that the US has not properly dealt with a set of older issues and problems. And um, I think on that note, I just hand it back to you, David. Thank you. Great, thank you very, very much. Well, a lot on the table here from each of our three speakers. Um, I saw a number of, uh, uh, co uh, constant themes among them, in particular, the, the notion that, that in terms of, of risk perceptions, I think that, that, that uh, you, you, you've had some expansion of thinking about the relationship be between disease response, local safety, issues and national security, uh, but at the same time, a commitment uh, by the authorities to, to keep defense orientation externally focused uh, and to, to keep it on, on uh, the, the framework, the four plus one framework that Mike talked about uh, that, that has been in place for a while. Several of you mentioned uh, the, the, the role of technology and innovations in technology moving ahead and perhaps even facilitated by this. Uh, I think that, that Mackenzie mentioned early on, I think correctly, uh, that, that the time period of COVID has coincided with, I think, a, a greater consensus domestically uh, in terms of thinking about China uh, from a, a, uh, uh, a, a more serious risk and challenge perspective. Uh, let me ask each of you to comment on the following question. So, so we, we're five weeks from today is our election. Uh, you know, does it make a lot of difference in terms of defense strategy, uh, defense expenditures, and orientation uh, on who wins the election? Or uh, I think that I heard in each of the of the presentations a a a sense that that the that the impact of of this might be less than uh, you would guess from just reading the front pages of the media. Who want, Mackenzie? Do you want to? go first at this and, and then I'll ask Franz and then Mike. Sure, thanks, David. Uh, I do, you know, I work carefully tracking the statements of both gentlemen running for president, uh, as well as the people who they surround themselves with, senior advisors and others who talk and write and publish and that sort of thing. And you do see more continuity than change uh, between these two. And that's obviously for, to start with, President Trump is not a traditional Republican in the classic sense. He's not a Reagan Republican, even if he claims to be on some things. 
Uh, and so there, you know, if, if this politics is a circle as opposed to a continuum, they meet uh, more often than not at the bottom end of the circle. And so, for example, um, you know, drawing down forces overseas. And in fact, President Biden would leave more forces forward deployed and in places of conflict like Afghanistan than President Trump would if both were given like free reign. Uh, so uh, you see uh, in terms of with some tweaks, I think Michael did a really good job outlining what those might be, but you know, reaffirming the threats, but but trying to do it under the existing top line, right? So in the absence of additional resources, how do you do it better or smarter? Well, you're gonna have to take money from, you know, out of hide. And so Secretary Esper's already been talking about that. He says, I'm gonna cut legacy systems. He means things like ships, vehicles, and aircraft. And what the Defense Department has been proposing pretty much for the last five years anyway, just in smaller numbers. You'll see a shrinking of things like the size, uh, General Goldfein before I retired said, I'm gonna shrink the size of the squadron, not just the number of overall squadrons as a way to sort of get at more money to invest. Both uh, President Trump and candidate Biden, the things they talk about reinvesting in are all the same things that this team is investing in, which are built on the Obama administration's uh, second term Defense Department's thinking, right? So. If you could name it, I promise you they put more money into it, ranging from missiles and munitions to, you know, 5G to the artificial intelligence, directed energy, quantum computing, additive manufacturing, direct, um, I already said directed energy. You get the idea. So big data, et cetera, machine learning. You know, both teams are going to continue to take money from procurement and put it into these developmental programs in the hopes that some can move into production sooner rather than later. I really want to hear more from Franz though on on how ABMS was uh, helping with pandemic response because I haven't heard that before. So I just wanted to raise my hand as a, as an audience member. But these are some of the trends you're going to see. Um, I'm not saying they won't diverge in some ways. You know, I think for example, David, you know, candidate Biden would love to reverse the embassy in Jerusalem decision, but it's going to be too far down. But what could he revisit? The JCPOA with uh, the Iran nuclear deal. What will he absolutely revisit? The withdrawal from INF and the what seems likely withdrawal from New Start. Uh, partly that will be to justify reducing the triad spending. He's, yeah. If you have to get money from somewhere in the defense budget, that's probably where you're going to go first. But you don't want to do that in the absence of a strategic rationale and extending New Start would be one of those rationales. Yeah. Thank you very, very much. Michael. Mackenzie, as usual, outlined it brilliantly. And uh, I think the differences between Biden and Trump or their teams are in the realm of nuance and also unpredictable to the extent that we don't yet know who would be uh, a Trump second term Secretary of Defense. Uh, we, we probably can guess better about who Biden's Secretary of Defense would be in January than about Trump's. And, uh, and so there are those kinds of question marks. So rather than try to parse based on my best guesses and get into that level of detail, because I think Mackenzie already outlined the basic reality that there's a lot more similarity than difference at a conceptual level. Um, I will just make two points. One, to belabor the obvious, which is that Trump is the more unpredictable personality. <laughs> and I think we have to presume that that could extend to matters of defense strategy and budget as well in a second term, once reelected, there's, it's very hard to tell how a reelected Donald Trump would behave. Would he follow some of his more original and traditional and isolationist instincts? When I say traditional, I mean traditional for him, not for the country, uh, and actually really break the bipartisan consensus on US internationalism and engagement as he had essentially originally campaigned to do, but then was more or less talked out of it and hired people like Jim Mattis and Mark Esper and H.R. McMaster who, and Mike Pompeo, who embodied the traditional internationalist engagement, even if in a more hawkish way than a democratic group might. So there's that question. But the, all, the other thing I wanna to touch on is when we think about the big, broad structural pressures facing the country, and this is gonna pick up on my earlier point about what are the realistic uh, choices before a new president just to expand on my earlier logic, let's say that one of these gentlemen was presented with an option to cut $100 billion out of the annual defense budget. So to go from 740 back to 650, sort of traditional late Obama numbers. 
um, or somewhere or low 600s. Is that really going to feel like it's worth it to either one of them? We've got a deficit that's a trillion dollars in good times. It's two to four trillion dollars at the moment. A hundred billion makes a dent in that, but it doesn't fix it. it. Doesn't even begin to fix it. So why would you open up the potential vulnerability politically and strategically? Because this would require, you know, substantial cuts in force structure right away if you were going to actually make any kind of serious move towards a defense budget of 100 billion a year less. And I think when people examine the pain and the risk associated with doing that, they're not gonna find it appealing. Um, it's, you know, if you're Joe Biden, you just won the election, but you've got a bad economy. The midterm elections are only two years away. Uh, Re-election effort or, you know, the next presidential race only four years away. And you don't wanna open up vulnerabilities on this kind of an issue. You don't wanna hand the Republicans uh, an issue that they've proven to be very good at exploiting for, in Biden's case, his entire uh, adult political career. So I just don't see how anybody's going to find it appealing to try to make big cuts. And therefore, what they're going to try to do is find trade space within a top line flat budget to make smaller force structure um, decisions, ways to make more efficient and more economical a force structure that's not too different from today's, but a little cheaper, a little smaller, in order to free up resources to pursue the kinds of high level innovation and modernization efforts that McKenzie just alluded to, and that really both parties endorse, going back to the third offset of the latter Obama years under Ash Carter, which then of course led into the national defense strategy of Trump. So it's a long way of saying that I don't predict any radical change in defense policy, and I don't even see that much daylight between Trump and Biden, at least on this issue, with the caveat that Trump is unpredictable. Thank you, Mike. Franz. Yes, well, I'm trying to pick up on a couple of uh, uh, issues that Mackenzie and Michael have raised and um, just to perhaps expand or reiterate them. Um, I think, first of all, I think it's going to be hugely important in terms of um, allied and uh, the allies and um, partners, U.S. partners, when it comes, you know, who is going to win, win the election, of course. And there's a, in a sense, it's definitely going to impact U.S. national defense strategy in one way or the other, and I think the major factor here is what both of you already hinted at to a certain degree, volatility. The difference between a Trump administration and a Biden administration is really this unpredictable factor that uh, a new Trump administration would likely um, entail for allies and partners. Um, I think also I would broadly agree that basically this 2018 national defense strategy and the documents around it that were developed are pretty much bipartisan consensus to, to a large degree. That is, that is, um, that is true. Um, I do think that there's going to be a difference in terms of um, trying to cut uh, legacy systems between Biden and uh, a Trump administration. I would say that Biden would probably be much more aggressive when it comes to that. This is already reflected in some of the uh, statements made by members of the Biden uh, campaign team, but also by people who likely will have senior positions within the Biden administration in the department. Um, of defense, and I do think that the Trump, uh, the Trump administration, to a certain degree at least, is taking a more conservative approach there. And again, there's this unpredictable factor of Trump getting really interested in one particular weapons system or weapons platform, for example, such as the Ford class carrier. He was very interested in, I think, it was the arrested gear um, 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 of that particular carrier, and he was in having an argument with, with naval officers about it, if I remember, two years ago. Um, and then the other important factor, I think, is going to be nuclear modernization, where we're going to see maybe some difference at least. And this is really largely related to what Mackenzie already said about um, um, arms limitations treaties and so forth, and what is really going to happen to the arms control architecture in a second Trump term. And I do think that this is going to be hugely important also because it's going to consume a large chunk of the defense budget, and um, it's also going to have a, a, an impact on global strategic uh, uh, stability. And then um, I think my last point would probably be a broader one, which I find um, I, I find it somewhat almost disconcerting a bit that there's really going to be not that much difference between the Biden and Trump administration when it comes to uh, the defense outlook, because the world is dramatically changing. And that goes back to my originally 
original point um, um, that I made uh, during my remarks, and that is really to what degree are some of the core assumptions are really still true when it comes to um, as they're outlined in the national defense strategy. This paradigm of great power competition makes a lot of sense inside of DC. It makes a lot of sense but in the US Armed Forces, but what about the wider world? And um, does it really, is this really the new paradigm? And I do think the biggest issue when it comes to foreign policy uh, blunders and, and problems is usually that people don't ask the simple questions at the beginning or don't go back to asking the simple questions. And because we are all bogged down in all these different details later on, but I keep on going back to the simple question, is this really going to be the new paradigm for a new administration? Do we need to revisit that? And I think the answer is probably no. This is really going to stick around great power competition and this idea that we are uh, competing with Russia and China and that this is going to be the focus with all these other um, subcategories, essentially. Um, let me stop right here, perhaps. Thank you, Franz. Uh, so uh, it's now getting to time when we turn to the audience. If you could please raise your hands. Uh, and I will call on you just a couple of observations from the chair here. And the, the, the first uh, observation I'll make is on Franz's statement on budget deficits and, and interest rates, because it's a really important one. Uh, and and I, I do believe that as long as interest rates are really low that that the, that the U.S. in particular, all countries, but the U.S. more than most, be because uh, the the dollar does remain the hegemonic global currency even during a time of relative uh, dollar weakness. Uh, that 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 dollar hegemony gives. The U.S. a lot more fiscal space. The question is, and it's not a question, I think, for 2021. It may not even be a question for 2022. Uh, but at at some point, I I do think uh, that that market pressures around interest rates uh, and debt uh, are going to raise their head, not just for the United States, but for all countries. And at that point, I think at that point, the budget dynamics that we're talking about now, that I think all of you have talked about in a realistic way, they could change quite dr dramatically. Uh, and if you're looking at risk factors out there to the to the outlooks that I heard from all of you. I would say the biggest one is on the, these debt interest rate dynamics that, that so far are extremely benign, uh, but in my view uh, are unlikely to remain extremely benign over the medium term, although <clears throat> I, I agree that they're unlikely to shift in the shorter term. <clears throat> so. That, that's theme one. The second, the second theme that, that strikes me is, is I'm, I'm not sure that we don't still remain vulnerable uh, to a, a shift in priorities, at least partially, back to a melding of sort of war on terror terrorism, counter-extremism efforts, uh, and, and gr great power competition. If there were to be a, another major terrorist event, either here in the United States or against U.S. interests somewhere around the world, I think the, the politics of how we think about defense priorities uh, is still very vulnerable to change. Uh, and I think if we've learned anything in, in recent decades, it's that, that the assumptions, the very, very broad macro assumptions 
about the risk environments that we make don't necessarily hold. Uh, and, and, and so I, 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 I agree with all of you that, that at least for now, the, that framework of great power competition is the dominant framework and increasingly within it, it's China, not Russia. Uh, but uh, I do think that there is some, some vulnerabilities there, particularly on the extremism and terrorism side. Uh, hey, could, could I ask, can I ask one quick or add one quick point? Please. Just to agree with you, but in a, in a somewhat different direction. The other, the other variable here, I believe, if the national security community in the United States sort of overplays its hand and the American public start to, starts to think that we're sort of spoiling for a fight with Russia or China, that we really think it's likely that we should fight one of these great powers over you know, the Donbass region of Eastern Ukraine or over the Senkaku Islands or some other relatively insignificant, far away and previously unheard of location. I think the American public is gonna perhaps start to wonder where the national security community developed this, you know, excessive sense of threat. And uh, I've tried to write about how I think we have to handle sort of more probing attacks, limited attacks, you know, trying to avoid an escalation to an all-out military confrontation. But there is an element of thinking in the broader U.S. national security community informed by the realist tradition in international relations theory and uh, informed by specific studies of Russia and China and the somewhat nasty nature of their current leadership that makes a lot of American <laughs> strategists, <clears throat> excuse me, believe that we, we almost have a high likelihood of war. And to the extent that makes us almost fall into a deterministic way of thinking where we're expecting a fight and therefore at the first sign of trouble, we sort of veer in that direction. Uh, I think the American public may start to wonder what it is about you know, the national security community that is so bent on conflict. And frankly, there may turn out at that point to be a few more Donald Trumps in our midst than we currently think. By that Donald Trump, I mean the one who doesn't really feel like all these international engagements and wars are really worth it. So I think that's one more wild card that has to be kept in mind. Yeah, that's a really good point. And in my view, the specifics around this are, are the, and the scenarios could very well play out uh, in not a Chinese assault on Taiwan, but a salami slicing approach by Beijing towards reunification. Uh, and Mike has written about this for those of you who are interested in this theme. If, if you Google the Senkaku dilemma, uh, you, you you will be able to learn more about Mike's thinking on this. Uh, let me turn to my colleague, E.J. Harold, who is the director of the IISS Americas office here in Washington, D.C. for the first question. Thank you, David. Uh, an absolutely fascinating discussion uh, by all of the uh, commentators. I'm, I'm struck by the fact that in this discussion, there's been no real address of alternatives to, uh, to defense. So we've been talking about defense and security affected by COVID-19, the impact on the budget and the risks that the budget presents uh, for the future. Uh, but we haven't talked about sort of whole of government approaches, strengthening the State Department, reinvigorating the other tools in the toolbox besides defense and whether or not that offers a an alternative view of the future and ways to address the challenges that uh, this pandemic has exposed in the way that we've been behaving to date. Okay, very good qu question, EJ. Uh, uh, and who who would like to take this? Mike, thank you. And then we'll go on to our other two speakers as well. So I'll start and thank you, EJ, for the excellent question. A couple of points. First of all, it's interesting. I hadn't looked in a little bit, but the budgets for state and for US development assistance 
are actually not in bad shape right now. And most of the noise the last few years has been, always been about how Trump always wanted to cut them 30% and Congress in a bipartisan way wouldn't let him. But if you actually look at the trend line since, let's say the 1990s, uh, real spending on the so-called 150 budget and development assistance has roughly doubled in real terms, which I support. It's always fragile, it's always under attack. Um, it's currently under attack by the President of the United States. But nonetheless, that tool, I think, needs to be reinvigorated more in terms of morale and professionalism and depoliticization rather than resources per se. That would be my first point. My second point, though, and to agree with you, I think, even a little bit more than I did on the first point, is to say that I believe we do need to broaden and reconceptualize U.S. national security thinking. And I've suggested in, um, in a recent article in my forthcoming book, an additional four plus one threat matrix where the, the new four plus one does not replace the old four plus one of Russia, China, North Korea, <clears throat> and transnational extremism, but it complements or maybe exacerbates uh, or should be positioned along a separate axis. And by those, I mean biological threats, nuclear threats, which of course have been around a while, but continue to manifest themselves in new and troubling ways all the time. Uh, climatic threats, digital threats, everything from cyber vulnerability to the you know, potential future under artificial intelligence. And then finally, internal weakness as a nation, which is the plus one. Because if we don't want to support internationalism, I think everything else is now fragile and vulnerable, whether it's military, diplomatic, or other kinds of American leadership. So I think we do need to broaden the definition. I'm not sure how much the second four plus one really affects the defense budget and defense policy. I think it's, a, as you say, a broader whole of government set of questions. Some of it's more about CDC, WHO, tools like that. It's not all big money. Sometimes it's modest money, uh, but I, I would accept that point. Very lastly, uh, in my Senkaku Paradox book, I do talk about benefiting from the fact that we've gotten more sophisticated in our use of economic sanctions and thinking about the economic sanctions toolkit as a way to deter Russia and China with a little bit more uh, patience and a little bit more sense of confidence in our overall position than we sometimes otherwise display. I don't wanna use sanctions for each and every little problem around the world. I'd rather save them for the bigger problems, uh, but I think we've gotten better at applying them and they can provide uh, an alternative to a robust direct military response for certain kinds of limited Russian and Chinese probing attacks, especially where core allied interests of the United States are not immediately threatened. Thanks. Uh, I'll jump in, David. It's a great question. Please. Totally uh, agree with the, the premise. The only thing I would disagree, and it's not really a disagreement, is just uh, and the use of the phrase alternative to the NDS. If you look at the security strategy from which the, the defense strategy is derivative, it is it is much broader in focus. Defense is a small part of competition with China. And, and in fact, the Michael referenced earlier, the Defense Strategy Commission of 2018. In fact, that was really, I'd say, one of the themes of their findings over and over and over was uh, because we live in this world, that's been the emphasis of our discussion. But in the broader scheme of things, uh, you saw the White House and the NSC earlier this year, actually a really interesting and detailed step-by-step a game plan to, to compete better with China across the US government. And that requires some of the tools you've referenced and Michael, but even more, you know, intelligence in other places. We just don't have a defense secretary who just talks about it as much. But if you look at an underlying assumption of this defense strategy, which I think upends all previous ones, it really, and it's more of an unspoken one, uh, and, and the we'll know it by its fruit if it actually happens, but that one of those assumptions is that the department will get less busy. It will stop doing um, the endless presence and assurance and deterrence missions around the world so that it can better compete and, and have high readiness for war fighting. For better or ill, that's an assumption. So Secretary Esper has talked about refocusing the time, tasks, and attention of the department, not just the dollars. And that's really hard to do with a workforce of you know three million people direct payroll. Uh, and what we're seeing is actually out in, in sort of the real world, this isn't happening because of the pandemic, sure, was like Defender Europe 20 uh, canceled. Yes, unfortunately. But what we're seeing, like, for example, just last week, um, 
uh, David Larder was reporting that we're going to do a double pump with an aircraft carrier crew. They just returned from a record level deployment and they are going to turn around in half a year's time and go back out on another record length deployment. That arguably is totally unnecessary and exactly the kind of thing you would stop doing right now while you have the moment to um, repurpose the force, refocus, to, to learn how to say no to yourself as the chiefs and the combat commanders and to policymakers. And this is something the Defense Department just it's going to take a leadership team committed to doing this who has the political capital to, to talk to Congress and the White House about it and to rein in combatant commanders. But that is a perfect example of something that should have changed and could have. And uh, I think we need to start questioning why. Why was that? Is that necessary? Why are you going to wear out these sailors? Uh, I'm sure the majority of them wouldn't, won't reenlist after that. That in, when we're not, you know, they're not in this direct um, hostility where something like that's required. <laughs> Front. Um, two really short points, and I think it goes back um, to um, this idea of great power competition again. I know I keep on coming back to this, but I do think it's important because one of the downsides <laughs> of having this framework in place is really seeing the world from a U.S. perspective in terms of either you're with us or you're with China or Russia or with any of the other states. And I think this is really going to be a problem because it really frames the world also in terms of primarily military economic competition. So um, as long as you have that framework in place, I think it's going to be really, really uh, difficult for organizations such as the Department of State to really be able to stand up to the Department of Defense. It's not just an imbalance in resources, but it's just a, a fundamental problem that you have when, for example, a combatant commander, a U.S. combatant commander is considered to be more important than an ambassador in particular region, regions of the world. And this really speaks to, I think, a mind shift that needs to, needs to occur among certain segments of the policy class in Washington, D.C., and I don't really see this impacted by COVID-19 at all. And um, my last point would be, or my second point rather, would, would be about the information space. And I think what COVID-19 has shown is actually that um, there's an inherent first move advantage when it comes to information operations. And I know I'm framing it now in military terms, but this is also supposed to be the tool toolkit of an organization in the toolkit of an organization like the Department of State and some of its sub organizations. This idea of really trying uh, to conduct influence campaigns and really public diplomacy and all the stuff and of and information operations in general. And what we saw in the first couple of weeks when it came to China and even Russia, they were really, really good at really uh, first moving in and, and ostensibly, and I say ostensibly helping a couple of other countries in dire needs. There was this big television uh, uh, a moment when China was landing airplanes in Italy and was handing over masks that later turned out to be completely useless. But in any case, so I think this is really a very important po a point that AJ raised here. One comment from me here. Uh, so, so I think that the dilemma is a very deep one. Um, part of this is that 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 I think that that uh, the military and military commanders have a, a, a real imperative uh, to sort of show the flag and show the force in situations short of war, uh, and, and that and that that's not going to go away. I think that increases, if anything, uh, in the context of gr greater um, uh, competition between the powers. I mean, that, that's what, what f freedom of navigation operations uh, in the South China Sea and elsewhere uh, in, in adjacent waters is all about. So I think that, that the the use of the military for uh, non-warfare functions uh, is is something that that has been on the rise. I don't see that uh, uh, drawing down. Of course, the military have been huge supporters of substantial funding for the non-military components uh, of the U.S. security establishment, particularly diplomacy and development, but that the, the, both the congressional side of this and even the executive branch side of this, it doesn't work in a way that those tr 
trade-offs are directly uh, uh, contemplated. So the, the committees in Congress that are responsible uh, for, for defense budgetary planning are different from those that are responsible for the 150 account that, 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 that Michael was talking about. So I think it's very, very hard in practice to, to get that to get that balance and it is one that, that there's been a tension here for a very, very, very long time. And I'm, I'm pers personally not optimistic about uh, our ability to get our arms around this, but Mike makes an important point that from, from a fiscal perspective, uh, th these, these functions have actually not done badly uh, in recent decades. Further questions from the floor, please. Uh, I, we, we don't want the, uh, the, the, the three speakers and myself to, 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 to dominate the discussions here. I don't see any hands up right now. Uh, any questions here? Thank you very much, Ms. Uh, Mr. Kumar, or Ms. Kumar. Uh, thank you so much. Uh, it's a very interesting discussion. Uh, my question really is this, that uh, considering the fact that China today has a considerable advantage now in the sense that the economy is recovering, uh, the political leadership is quite stable, and it has practically uh, sort of taken care of the COVID uh, threat uh, domestically. Uh, it certainly has a strategic advantage, considering the fact that all the other countries, the US and so on and so forth, they are actually going, to, going in for a prolonged economic crisis. There's a kind of a domestic uh, political struggle which is taking going on there. So in a situation when the China follows strategy of changing facts on the ground, uh, having, I mean, staying below the, let's say, conflict threshold, in a, in a somewhat medium-term scenario, they certainly see for themselves a great uh, strategic advantage, and they might perhaps be hoping that they can actually turn things to their advantage in a, in a larger strategic sense. Thank you. Very good question. Uh, who, who would like to take the first uh, shot at this? Mackenzie? Sure, thank you. I, I, I think that the way you've characterized it is the way that Pentagon leadership views Chinese leaders as seeing the situation playing out as in to their advantage. And so when Secretary Esper just a couple of weeks ago was on the West Coast, he gave a, a speech, I believe at the RAND Corporation, and in it he outlined dozens upon dozens of uh, initiatives and new ideas and programs and policies and task forces. I mean, you name it, it was in there and directly and squarely aimed at countering this, this narrative uh, and countering this perception and really in his view, this reality, which is not true, that, um, that their economy isn't that strong, that the Communist Party is not a, a system that Americans would want to emulate, that um, the way that they've been able to get their hands around coronavirus through basically, you know, the use of technology and forcing their citizens to do things, some things against their will is not our model either, and nor would it be even possible, nor should it be. Uh, I'd say just in, from a Pentagon perspective, yes, they, they see this as, as a challenge to overcome, and they're increasingly trying to battle back that narrative, but also truly stand up a lot of, um, of concrete and tangible projects and programs that will outlast the Secretary of Defense. A lot of this has to do with the now departed Randy Shriver, who was handling the Asia port, indo pacom portfolio for DOD, and he was really the brainchild behind a lot of these. And I think it will help eventually, but the, the questioner has a point that for now, I think that there's the risk that the narrative will, um, that, we're, that it will calcify and solidify, and once it does, it's gonna be hard to undo. Mike. 
Thank you. Excellent point. Uh, two quick things. First, David, on the earlier discussion you and Mackenzie were having about the use of aircraft carriers and other assets to project influence and show the flag. Uh, I agree that I think you're both correct. The pressures are still always there from the combatant commanders. I would cite some very good work recently done in a book by Barry Blackman and Melanie Sisson at the Stimson Center, where we picked up, or Barry picked up on his earlier famous book, Force Without War. And one of the things they showed in this book pretty convincingly with statistical evidence and case studies from the post-Cold War era is that yes, response is important. Yes, presence is important, but the ways in which and the assets you use in order to carry out that presence are much more flexible. And uh, you don't have to always send a big flat deck aircraft carrier to achieve a given outcome. You can use amphibious ready groups. You can use uh, squadrons of destroyers. You can do a lot of different things. And depending on the scenario, obviously, and depending on the likelihood of having to quickly use force, um, you can be a little bit more creative. So I would just wanna drive home that point. It was very good empirical work. And secondly, uh, Yogendra, thank you for your question. Um, I would note that to the extent China thinks it's being clever with salami, salami slicing and gray area efforts um, and creating facts on the ground, I would also note that your country in particular, if I'm guessing correctly that you're calling from India or that you have Indian um, affiliations, the role of India here is extraordinarily important. And to see the world's uh, you know, soon to be most populous country, dynamic economy, great civilization, great democracy, aligning more and more with a group of like-minded countries in the broader Asia Pacific, Indo-Pacific region, uh, that are interested in pressuring and pushing back against China, that is hugely consequential. And it underscores how lonely China's geostrategic position already is and will continue to be. One thing the United States needs to bear in mind is the number of powerful allies we have. And even if India and the United States are not formal allies and probably should not be uh, formal allies, they can be aligned in pursuit of a common agenda of openness and pushback against Chinese influence to the extent China accelerates that dynamic, it's losing, not winning, the broader geostrategic competition because of India's inherent power and importance. Franz. Uh, yes, two quick points here. My first one would be that I think what Michael said is really going to be crucially important in the years down the road, and that is this perception of um, or this idea that we equate deterrence with presence. I think this is something that we'll need to change just because we are moving towards more of a network centric force structure overall, where networks are much gonna be much more important than platforms in general. So um, we might no longer be able to send an aircraft or want to send an aircraft carrier to a certain part of the region, but we really can have other means available to actually um, conventionally deter a, a, an opponent from doing certain things that we don't want to do. And this is going to be especially important, of course, in the cyber dimension, but also when it comes to long range, uh, lay, uh, excuse me, long range kinetic strike capabilities, for example, that are into development, uh, conventional long range kinetic strike capabilities. So I think that's one point I think crucially about deterrence in the future. And then the second point about China really, um, I think that's what uh, uh, was hinted at, is exploiting windows of opportunities because of this, this economic downturn. I see this happening to a certain degree, perhaps, but I think overall, it's not something that the United States should be particularly worried about. I think it's partially, there's a partial obsession with this uh, because this is, it, it's part of US political and military culture um, to really, um, this idea, and it's also, again, mani manifests itself in some of the recent documents, US documents that the United States military has this idea that it always needs to be first uh, uh, in battle and it needs to win the first battle in any confrontation once conventional deterrence breaks down. If you look at US history, this has never really been the case with few exceptions. The United States has, has always throughout history been a great comeback power. It has never been like a first move of power in many, many ways. And I think this is also something cultural that, that probably uh, uh, needs to change, but it's also something, uh, a reason why I think the United States obsesses about this so much this idea that China can exploit the current situation and that at some point again, you know, there's going to be a big surprise again and the United States is going to lose initially um, a, a confrontation with the Chinese government. Thank you very, very much. We're, we're now at uh, the, 
the end point of, of our session. Uh, let me ask each of the speakers to, for any final comments that they, that, that they might have uh, and to hold your remarks to one minute each. And let me uh, begin with Mackenzie. Thank you. Uh, right, so I would just say um, to, to the last point, that's, that's totally fair. I, I think that we, I'm surprised at where this conversation went, which is this theme between the three of us that presence, uh, deterrence and presence are no longer synonymous. Uh, it's a matter of, will others catch up and see it the same way? And by that, I mean our allies, which is the majority of whom we are responding to with these assurance. Sure, there's dissuasion and coercion and the other's persuasion that we want to do, but a lot of this is assurance. Uh, and so in the digital era, will are the tools credible enough or knowable enough to be valuable? And, and does the next leadership team at the top for, for DOD in particular agree with that? Because if they do, then you can stop the double pumping of the carrier crew. You can, presumably, you can change, as Michael said, the tools by which you respond to various um, issues and crises you know, in the Med or the South China Sea or wherever. And I, I would like to, perhaps that will be a positive to come out of the coronavirus is that, that this will lead to potentially a tectonic shift in military thinking. Mike, thank you very much, Mackenzie. Mike. Excellent points. And let me just continue this thread with one final observation. I still remain strongly in favor of permanent US military presence on the ground in places like South Korea, Japan, Germany, Poland, other countries in Europe, other countries in the broader Middle East. I think the degree to which you prove that you're committed in places especially of acute threat and danger is reinforced dramatically by adversaries knowing you would be involved in a fight from day one. And even if you didn't wanna be, it would be too late because you would have been implicated by your very location. So I'm strongly in support of that. I think you can have a good debate about whether we need you know, 30,000 or 35,000 troops in Germany. Uh, I don't like the way President Trump made the decision and it sounded like vindication against Angela Merkel, but the strategy of reapportioning is you know, a, a legitimate thing to rethink. Uh, but the basic concept, I do want us to be more flexible on use of temporary deployments and naval assets. I don't wanna see us pull back from our major overseas land presence that we have in key uh, locations in Northeast Asia, Europe, and the broader Middle East. In the broader Middle East, you may be able to tweak one or two. Maybe over time, you pull back from one of the half dozen places or so that were present. But the, the core elements of US global military posture on land, I think are smart and should be sustained. Thank you, David. Thank you. Runs for the last word. Uh, yes, I mean, I agree with basically everything that uh, Mackenzie and Michael just said. Um, I think just to reiterate, I think this, this uh, idea of presence and uh, deterrence and how to sell it to the allies is going to be crucial in, uh, down the road also because I don't think allies will really be able to keep up with the United States modernization efforts when it comes to these new concepts that I was uh, talking about, multi-domain uh, domain operations, uh, distributed operations in general. So there are going to be some interoperability issues down the road, particularly when it comes to the NATO alliance, but also with uh, key partner and allies in, in, in Asia, such as uh, South Korea, Japan, um, and, and so forth. So I do think that's something something really important. And I do think that, that there's going to be some impact again on this uh, uh, by COVID-19, particularly uh, in Europe. I see that defense budgets are going to be massively shrinking, at least um, over the next couple of years. So, so, so I think there needs to be a better dialogue with allies and partners when it comes to US modernization efforts and, and overall defense strategy. Thank you. Thank you all very, very much. That was a terrific discussion. We, we opened up all sorts of useful lines of debate. Uh, the IISS is really pleased to be able uh, to organize these kinds of sessions. And the final comments really lead me to urge everybody uh, here to reconvene uh, for our discussion of Europe uh, on October 7th at 11 a.m. And Franz's point is absolutely correct that, that while the U.S. Uh, defense budget may be uh, at marginal risk, at least in the short term, 
The same is not the case uh, for the budgets of our NATO allies, and, and that will be one of the issues that we grapple with in that session. So thank you, Mackenzie. Thank you, Mike. Thank you, Franz. Uh, and with that, I will bring today's IISS webinar to a close. Look forward to seeing all of you uh, on October 7th. Bye-bye now.